Have you ever wondered what could have possibly incited the massive upheaval known as the 1905 Russian Revolution? Our story begins in the heart of St. Petersburg, in the cold grasp of December 1904. The Putilov factory, a bustling hub of industry, becomes the birthplace of a strike that would echo through history. Tensions were simmering, the workers' patience wearing thin. What started as a single factory's protest against unfair work conditions soon ignited a citywide inferno of dissent. As the word of the strike spread, it resonated with the frustrations of workers in other factories. Before long, the number of strikers swelled to an astounding 80,000. The city of St. Petersburg was on the brink of something monumental. Enter Pastor Gapon, a pro-Tsarist union leader and an agent of the Oranka. Gapon, despite his affiliations, found himself drawn to the cause of the workers. He took it upon himself to organize a peaceful demonstration, an attempt to voice the concerns of the workers to the Tsar himself. He hoped, perhaps naively, that the Tsar would listen to the pleas of his people and address their discomfort. But hope, as they say, is a dangerous thing. Gapon, along with the masses, marched towards the Winter Palace, their spirits high, their demands clear. They believed that the Tsar would hear them, that their voices would cut through the cold winter air and reach the ears of the man who held their fates in his hands. Little did Gaipon know his peaceful demonstration would soon turn into a bloody massacre, marking the beginning of the 1905 revolution. The first sparks of revolution were ignited, not by the roar of a cannon, but by the silent cries of the unarmed and the oppressed. The events that unfolded on that fateful day would forever be known as Bloody Sunday, a day that marked the beginning of a revolution that would shake the very foundations of the Tsarist regime. January 22, 1905, a day that would forever be etched in history as Bloody Sunday. On this winter's day, the streets of St. Petersburg were not filled with merriment, but with a palpable tension. The city was on the brink of something significant, something that would reverberate through the annals of history. The Putilov factory strike had grown into a citywide protest, with close to 80,000 workers standing in solidarity. At the helm was Pastor Gapon, a pro-Tsarist union leader and a ranker agent, who organized a peaceful workers' demonstration to the Winter Palace. Their objective was simple, to convey the workers' demands to the Tsar, their ruler. But what unfolded was a scene of unimaginable horror. Tsarist soldiers, the very men sworn to protect their people, opened fire on the unarmed crowd. Thousands fell, their dreams for a better life extinguished in an instant. The shockwave was felt not just by the surprised Pastor Gapon, but by the entire nation. Bloody Sunday was not just a massacre, it was a wake-up call. The Tsarist soldiers' bullets did not just kill the people, they ignited the first spark of the 1905 revolution. In their grief and anger, the people of Russia rose. Demonstrations and strikes swept across the nation, a wave of unrest that rippled through the Tsarist regime. The rising tide of separatist nationalism broke out in the Caucasus, sparking bloody conflicts between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Baku, a vital industrial city, was largely destroyed. In Russia's Poland, 400,000 workers abandoned their jobs in protest. The Tsarist regime, now faced with a nation on the brink of revolution, acted quickly. The Minister of Internal Affairs was dismissed and a commission was established to investigate the cause of the unrest among the workers in St. Petersburg. But even this commission, composed mostly of statesmen and factory owners, was liquidated without taking any action. The workers, under the influence of socialist parties, embarked on a revolutionary struggle to achieve their demands. The events of Bloody Sunday had lit a fire within them, a fire that could not be extinguished. The bloodshed on Bloody Sunday was merely a prelude to the storm that was about to come. In the face of such unrest, how did the Tsar respond? The answer to this question is a tale of too little, too late. Following the tragic events of Bloody Sunday, the Tsarist regime was quick to act, but their actions were more symbolic than substantial. The Minister of Internal Affairs was promptly dismissed, an act that may have been intended to placate the striking workers. Next came the establishment of a commission. Its purpose? To delve into the cause of the unrest among the St. Petersburg workers. 
However, the commission was largely made up of statesmen and factory owners, the very people who had been exploiting the workers and contributing to their discontent. Not surprisingly, the commission was ultimately liquidated without achieving any tangible results. Then there was the Boligin Statement, issued by Tsar Nicholas II on February 18, 1905. This was a momentous occasion, marking the first time that the Tsar had agreed to grant new rights to his subjects. The statement promised an advisory council, religious tolerance, freedom of speech, and the reduction of taxes collected from the peasants. These concessions were significant in the context of the autocratic Tsarist rule. However, they were not enough to quell the rising tide of discontent among the workers and the wider Russian populace. The Advisory Council, for instance, was merely a consultative body, with no real power to effect change. Freedom of speech was a welcome right, but without the power to influence policy, it was little more than a token gesture. The Beligian statement was a step in the right direction, but it was a small step. The workers wanted more than just promises. They wanted real, tangible change. They wanted a say in the governance of their country. They wanted their rights recognized and respected. They wanted justice. While the Tsar's response may have been a step towards reform, it was far from sufficient. The Russian Revolution was not just about economic grievances, it was a struggle for political power, for democracy, for a voice in the shaping of their own destiny. And in this struggle, the Tsar's response was found wanting. The demand for representation, a fundamental aspect of any democracy, was rising. Let's delve into a time when Russia was in the throes of change, and the wheels of democracy had started turning, albeit slowly. In the late spring of 1905, nearly 300 local Zemstvo representatives, the elected bodies of local self-government in rural Russia, gathered in Moscow. They convened on the 24th and 25th of May, their agenda clear. They demanded the right to be represented at the national level. This was a significant move, a step towards the establishment of a democratic system where the voices of all citizens could be heard. It's important to note that this demand was not merely a whim or a spur-of-the-moment decision. It was born out of months of unrest, strikes and demonstrations. The Zemstvo representatives were the voice of the people, echoing their desire for change and reform. They wanted a say in the governing of their country, a right that had been denied to them for too long. The Zemstvo representatives didn't just make demands, they took their case to the highest power in the land. On the 6th of June 1905, they met with Tsar Alexander II. This was a critical moment, the outcome of which could sway the course of history, and sway it did. In a move that surprised many, Tsar Alexander accepted the representatives' demands. This was a significant development, a landmark in the history of Russian democracy. The Tsar's acceptance marked the beginning of a shift in power dynamics. It signalled that the voices of the people could not be ignored, that they had a right to representation, and that this right would be recognised. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. The Tsar's acceptance was indeed a step forward, but it was just that, a step. The road to true democracy and representation was long and fraught with challenges. The revolution, as they say, was far from over. The Tsar's acceptance of the Zemstvo representatives' demand was a significant development, but the revolution was far from over. The establishment of the St. Petersburg Soviet marked a pivotal moment in the 1905 Russian Revolution. As the tumultuous year unfolded, the workers of Russia were not content with mere promises of reform. They wanted tangible change, and they were willing to go to great lengths to achieve it. In October 1905, the St. Petersburg Soviet was established. This was not a government-sanctioned council or a body of representatives handpicked by the Tsar. No, the Soviet was a grassroots organization sprung up spontaneously from the people themselves. It was a collective of workers and intellectuals, driven by a shared desire for justice and equality. The Soviet was not simply a talking shop. It had a clear, transformative agenda. Its first major act was to call for a general strike. 
The workers of St. Petersburg, who had already shown their willingness to down tools in the name of change, were more than ready to heed the call. The Soviets' appeal went beyond the factories, though. It reached out to the wider public, urging them to resist the Tsar's regime in any way they could. One of the most radical proposals was the call for citizens to stop paying their taxes. In a society where the Tsar's power was underpinned by his wealth, this was an audacious move. But it didn't stop there. The Soviet also encouraged people to withdraw their money from the banks. In a double blow to the Tsar's finances, the Soviet was not just challenging his authority, but actively undermining it. This was a bold, daring move, and it marked a significant escalation in the struggle against the Tsarist regime. The Soviet was not simply demanding change, it was actively working towards it. It was a powerful symbol of defiance, a beacon of hope for those who yearned for a more equitable society. The establishment of the St. Petersburg Soviet was the final act of defiance in the 1905 Russian Revolution, a testament to the power of the people when united against oppression.